A customer of mine has asked me to make some modifications to these valves. They're for controlling the flow of liquids in an autonomous factory. The valves use compressed air to open them and then have a big spring inside which pushes them shut. The valve body at the bottom here has just got a normal ball valve in it, just like you might find on a plumbing system. The actuator on top is where the air pipe connects to, which opens the valve. This means that the valve can be controlled by a computer or a PLC. I also have some manual valves to modify. They are also ball valves, but you just operate them by hand. I have to remove the end caps from the valves. They are just held on with these stainless bolts. There is a small tab on the valve body which one of the bolts passes through. By completely removing this bolt and just loosening the other three, I can remove both ends together. This works out ever so slightly faster than undoing them all fully at this stage. I can then take this little sub-assembly over to my parts trays, spin off all the nuts together, and then drop all the bolts together. It's just less hand movements, which saves a little bit of time. While I've got one in bits, I thought I'd take a moment to show you how a ball valve works. This is the seal, which stops the fluid going around the outside of the ball when the ball is closed. And this is the ball. It's a perfect sphere with a hole machined through the centre of it. When the valve is open, the hole lines up with the pipe to let the fluid flow through. When it's closed, it's turned through 90 degrees to block the flow. That little slot in the top of the ball lines up with the key in the top of the actuator, and that's what's used to rotate the ball from its open to closed position. The manual valves are a little bit quicker to get apart. I just mount them in the vise and then give the end cap a quick buzz with the windy gun. The seals on the other hand are a little bit more difficult to get out on these. Here's the ball seal. You have to get in from the back with a little pick tool or some sort of lever and just very very carefully pry the seal out. You've got to be so careful with this because if you scratch the seal the valve will leak. The outer seal can be just as fiddly. I find it's easiest to try and get a fingernail under it, get the edge up and then you can spin it round on the threads and sort of unscrew it from the end cap. With all the valves disassembled, I've now got the end caps for the manual valves on the left and the end caps for the automatic valves on the right. So let's have a look at what the modification actually is. All of the end caps get fitted with these tri-clamp flanges. They just screw in like this. Normally this joint is just filled with a sealant, but the customer has been having some problems. People have been grabbing hold of the valves and twisting them. The valve is rotating on the threads and it's breaking the sealant and then this joint is starting to leak. So the solution is that we're going to weld this joint. I'll just quickly show you how these tri-clamps work, because they're quite clever. You can have them with threaded ends like this for screwing into things, or just plain ends for welding straight onto the end of a pipe. There is a face seal that goes between the two flanges. You can get different seals depending on what material is in the pipe. The tri-clamp itself goes around the outside of the two flanges. The inside faces of the clamp are tapered the same as the outside faces of the flanges. This way, when the clamp is tightened, it pulls the two flanges closer together and squashes the seal between them. Oh my, that's a lot of shiny flange. Well, I guess I'd better put all of these together. When you're doing batch work like this, it really pays to try and do one operation on every single part before you move on to the next operation. It just saves so much time. Another little tip is to always plan one or two steps ahead. You'll notice that I've put all of these parts down and they're all facing the same way with the tri-clamps down. That's because the next operation needs them to be this way round. Because these parts are stainless, when they're welded they need to be gas purged. That just means we need shielding gas on both sides of the weld. Now, because they're a pipe, that means I need to block one end of the pipe. I do that by using aluminium tape, and since the parts are laid out in a nice neat grid, I can just use long pieces of tape rather than cutting individual pieces for each fitting, and again, it just saves a little bit of time. I can then just quickly go around with a Stanley knife and cut it into individual pieces. I flip all the fittings over so there's a little bit of weight on the tape, and it also makes them a little bit easier to handle once I've got my welding gloves on. 
I just use this clamp with a small spacer in it to hold the parts while I'm welding them. I have to peel back the tape ever so slightly just to make sure that you get a good earth connection between the clamp and the part. I'm going to be welding with DC TIG at about 70 amps with a 1.6mm 2% lanthanated tungsten and a 1.6mm 316 filler. Here's the purge pipe. This is just a little bit of stainless tube connected to some airline that goes back to a flow meter on the gas bottle. Now I did try and get some real close up arc shots for you for this, but the parts are so small and the camera really needs to be right where my face is, so unfortunately they didn't turn out so well. You might notice that every time I stop the torch and reposition the part, I leave the piece of filler wire stuck to the part. That's so that I can keep the end of the filler rod under the gas shield all the time while it's cooling and it helps prevent any contamination. Having done a few batches of these valves now, I'm really starting to see the potential value in a rotary positioner, so I think I'm going to have to bite the bullet and make one. Now that could be the next video, so if you're interested in seeing that, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you think there's someone you know that might enjoy this video, then please consider sharing it with them. Here they are, all welded up. I think they've turned out really nicely considering I haven't done any for a while. The brown staining that you can see on the valve faces is just where the tape adhesive is burnt onto the surface. This is easily removed by rubbing the surface lightly on some scotch Bright. I typically find between 40 and 60 strokes gets rid of all of the residue. To clean up the rest of the heat marks, I swapped out the steel wire wheel on the bench grinder for a stainless steel one. You don't want to use a steel wire wheel on stainless parts because the steel will get impregnated into the stainless and it will cause the surface to rust. Here they are all cleaned up, now let's start putting them back together. The manual valves are really easy to put back together. I simply hold the welded piece in the vise, slip the outer seal over the threads, being careful to make sure that it doesn't get damaged and it's the right way up. And then I can put in the inner seal, or the, the ball seal, again making sure it's the right way up and then put the valve on and quickly nip it up with a breaker bar with a socket on the end. And that's those ready for pressure testing. Now, the automatic valves are a little bit more complicated. The auto valves have an overall length tolerance once they're assembled. So what I'm doing is I'm putting down post-its from left to right, minimum size to maximum size in 0.1 millimeter increments. I can then measure every part and group them according to their length. A pair of parts can then be selected, essentially taking the largest one and the smallest one and working your way inwards from the two extremes so that the maximum number of parts are as close to the mean average nominal dimension as possible. This is basically a variation on the select on test method. I can then move on to putting three of the four bolts back in the holes. I'm just doing the bolts at this stage and then I'll do the nuts afterwards doing one operation on all of the parts, then doing the next operation on all of the parts, just saving that little bit of time. It accumulates over the project, and by the end of the job, you've saved a surprising amount of time. All of the parts are racked the same way around, so that the bolt head ends up on the left when I pick it up and position it to put it on the valve. And my part spins are positioned the same, so the bolts are on the left and the nuts are on the right. That way, when I put this bolt in, it always goes in the same way as the three that are already there, and I end up with them all the same on every valve. It's not strictly necessary, but I like doing it this way, and it also makes the next step a little bit easier. I do up all the nuts in a crisscross pattern, same as you would for a set of wheel studs on a car. This ensures that the two end faces are clamped nice and flat onto the valve seals, and helps to prevent any leaking. Once all of the ends are refitted, the valves are ready for pressure testing. For testing the valves, they're connected up to a leak test machine. This pipe pressurises the valve to replicate the fluid that would be under pressure in the valve under its normal operating conditions. The opposite end of the valve is fitted with a pressure transducer so that the pressure within the valve can be measured. An air fitting and an airline go into the control port so that the valve can be opened and closed by the tester. Press the start test button and off it goes. 
The valve opens, which floods the system with high pressure air. It then closes, trapping the air between the valve and the pressure transducer. The air on the supply side is then vented, and the system measures to see if there's any pressure drop between the transducer and the valve. The valve then opens again to vent the air from the transducer to make sure that the system is safe to disassemble. The ends are then simply swapped over so that the other side of the valve can also be tested. During the testing, various data is recorded, and every valve has its own unique serial number. So if there is ever a failure in the future, each valve has traceability. Finally, a few of the valves that have already been fitted have lost this little top cap, so a little bit of Loctite on the threads should prevent us losing any more in future. That's it for the auto valves, they can go back in the box. Now the manual valves, pretty much the same deal. The only difference, you have to operate the valve manually. And in the box they go. I hope you've enjoyed the video. It's slightly different to the ones I normally make. I've got a couple more projects like this coming up, so if you'd like to see more videos like this, then let me know. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and give the video a share if you think you know someone that would like it. Well, that will not do at all. I think a little bit of percussive maintenance may be required. Much better. Thanks for watching.